Um, I'm sure everybody knows who you are, but but just to go through uh, the motions, uh, Kath Pei is the founder and CEO of Holistic Email Marketing. Uh, in addition to being a best-selling author, we've already talked about her book. Don't forget, somebody will win a copy of the book this afternoon. Um, uh, and a finalist of the Business Book Awards, Kath was recently recognized as the 2021 EEC Thought Leader of the Year. So, uh, folks, if you haven't heard Kath speak, you're in for a treat. Kath, over to you. Thanks so much, Skip. Okay, so we're going to get started, and um, I, I, there's so much to talk uh, and bundle up uh, in here, even as I'm listening more to um, Philip's and Gianfranco's uh, presentations, I'm still thinking of more and more ideas, and I've got very, very limited time. And you might be thinking that um, this is just going to be a normal how to do testing. It's not, because we're talking personalization. So it's, I'm going to be talking about some slightly different issues here, right? Uh, so, so it's going to go beyond the importance. Yeah. Uh, quickly, that's um, our amazing clients, or some of our, our amazing clients. This is who I am, which you have just heard about that. So, um, we don't need to stay on that. And I am at the moment. <laughs> I am in Wales. Um, so I'm back in the UK for a short little visit. I'm normally in Antigua, started off in Australia, moved to um, the UK, and then moved on to Antigua. So my, my, my kind of background is a little bit different to what you may be used to um, seeing behind me um, if you've been listening to me of late. And this is the book as well that I've um, that Skip was mentioning that you can uh, um, you know stand a chance of winning today. It's available on Amazon. Um, Kindle's really really great value, so go ahead and grab one if you haven't already got one. I want to kick off this with actually identifying what your objective is with using personalization, because often when I'm speaking to my clients and my students. You know, I kind of, I, I, I get them a little bit confused because I say, so what is it that you want to achieve with personalization? And of course, they're kind of going, well, we, you know, because they usually just go, we want to use personalization because we want to use personalization, right? They're almost doing it for the sake of using personalization. You know, Skip started off with some great stats. If you use personalization, you'll get all of this. And so therefore, we, we don't tend to go that much further than that. But if you are going to just be doing that, then I think you're limiting yourself a bit. In my books, right, your objective with using personalization is actually to enhance the customer experience. Now, there are many, many ways that you can be doing that. And one of them is personalization. And it's an incredibly effective way of doing it. So I want to... Um, start off this presentation with planting that seed in your mind about this is our objective. We want to be enhancing the customer experience. And one of the ways we're doing that is by using personalization. And therefore, we want to be testing personalization. And whenever we do tests, we want to be mapping them back to the objective. What is it achieving? Right. So just keep that in your mind. I'll refer to that later on. So we've got the regular Y test. Now, you know, I can go down the Y test factor, generally speaking. Um, test is, you test because you don't want to leave money on the table. You test because you, you may know your audience, you may know your products, you may know your brand and, and everything, but you don't know everything. And our audiences are perpetually changing perpetually, as we've just seen with, you know, uh, 2020 and the pandemic and everything. So we are continually on, um, on a journey to try and find out more about them, to learn about them, to, to see what really makes them tick. And in the, specifically in the case of personalization, we want to know what kind of personalization works, right? So whether it's overt or covert, and I'm talking about on a maybe on a, a an automated program, maybe on a, um, a you know a regular campaign, a BAU campaign, um, or maybe we're actually just wanting to find out does personalization in general work against a holdout group or a control group of no personalization, 
right? So there's different ways we can be doing this. And again, this is going to be um, it, it dependent upon whether you've already got personalization in place and therefore you're actually wanting to optimize, improve, right, and refine um, your results or whether you haven't really started and we looked at the survey and there's a good percentage of you actually were in level two and level three and but there was still about I think 36 percent or so who were doing level one right so you guys are probably in a pretty good place to be doing these control groups but I'll talk about that in a minute okay there's meant to be a slide coming up there oh here we go now the thing is right I talk a lot about testing within email marketing and then one of the reasons I talk about that is because email is a natural channel, the, one of the easiest, one of the quickest, one of the, the most economical and cheapest channels to be testing in. And not only that, you can actually understand your results and roll it out to other channels, um, which I'll get to in a minute. But I want to throw personalization in the mix there too. All right. So years ago, um, I, I started up, the, I think, e-consultancy. E I was the first uh, trainer on personalization, not just for email marketing, but personalization in general. And one of the things that, you know, it was very, very clear when I'm teaching all of my students that they're all very understanding and in agreement that email is actually the easiest channel to be testing personalization on. Because email is the easiest channel to actually be conducting personalization through. So when you put that email and testing and personalization all come together, it's a beautiful fit, then it really makes sense for you to be testing, you know, uh, your personalization using your email channel. Now, this is that point I wanted to make to you, right? Your database is your target market. And that's one of the reasons why email testing, you know, anything in the email is easy it's cost effective it's quick because these guys and whether they're your prospects whether they're your customers whether they're your 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 um used to be customers right you need to reactivate them whatever the story is wherever they are in the in the life cycle as long as they're not unsubscribed you can actually be testing them through email right so it, it's a it's a great channel for that but we're going to go beyond that because we're really wanting to be looking at personalization, testing for personalization. So we're just going to look at some basics for testing for personalization. The majority of them are actually very, very similar to basic testing across the board, right? Um, first of all, you want to be designing, planning, and recording your results. And this is often where a lot of people go wrong because they'll just go, they, they do what I call ad hoc tests. Oh, I think we'll just do this test and we'll just do this. And they don't start with a hypothesis. They don't record it. They don't, you know, do anything like that. And so it's very limiting and it's basically just to see if there's an uplift in the campaign. Now, one of the things with personalization is sure we want to see is there an uplift in the campaign if we're doing an a b split test right is there no personalization versus personalization did the personalization um you know vary it did that actually give an uplift absolutely we want to understand that but we also want to understand it from the long term um, results as well so there's some longevity here there's some you know, there's the longitudinal learnings that we need to be understanding as well. And that's why these, you know, designing, carefully planning, strategizing, and recording the results is so very, very important when we're talking about testing for personalization. Because we're not talking about it's just a one off. We're talking about are we going to be implementing this permanently? And if we have decided to implement it permanently, how are we going to be optimizing and continually, you know, uh, incrementally improving our personalization email marketing program? And that's what we want to do. Hence, we need to be recording everything. The next one is we have to have a hypothesis. We just can't do a test without a hypothesis. And the reason for being is referring to that last point. 
if we're going to be doing this as a longitudinal learning, right? So we're going to be understanding what, what really works and we're going to make a big decision, then we have to be testing it multiple times. We can't just do a one test, you know, one campaign and say, oh, look at one, awesome. Or, oh, it didn't win. Okay, shucks, right? So we have to be doing multiple tests. In order for us to do multiple tests, we really need to be using a hypothesis. And that's going to ensure that everything that we're doing is following suit, that it's all supporting the hypothesis. And, um, and therefore, that's what we're going to be um, making sure that everything all lines up. So that's what the hypothesis does. It keeps us true so that the test that we're doing is absolutely to 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 what we believe right or to what we're trying to support or trying to discover sorry it's a very bit of a leg here so now i've got it here and i've put it very very simply here we want to be running the tests multiple times using a 50 50 split now generally speaking when you're doing a test with email marketing you do do a 50 50 split but not everyone realizes it's a 50 50 split so what you will do is you'll do a sample size so you don't necessarily you want to reduce the risk shall we say so instead of sending it to a hundred percent of that segment you're going to take out 20 percent of that segment you're going to send you know the control to 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 um 50 percent so 10 percent of that 20 percent 50%, which is 10% of the of the entire segment, and then the variant to the other 10%. So therefore, you are actually doing a 50-50 split test, but then you roll the winner out to the remaining 80%, right? So you still are doing 50-50%. Now, it's entirely up to you how you run tests, how you want to be doing them, and, and it may well change um, on a test-by-test on a -test basis as well, but understand that the greater the sample size, the more statistically significant the result is going to be. And so, um, you know, often you'll find, certainly when you're testing personalization, you might end up finding out it's easy just to do a, a, an AB split of 50-50 the whole way, right? But again, I'm not gonna just say that that's what you should do. All I'm saying is that if you do a test of, say, 10% control or, or maybe 10% variant and 90% um, being the actual um, uh, the control, right, you're not going to get the right result because there, there is imbalances and there will be variables and, and so you're not actually doing the proper thing. So whenever you're doing a test, try and do 50-50 whether it's 50-50 and then roll it all out or complete 50-50 of that segment. <clears throat> Choose your success metric wisely. Now, this is one of the things I talk about a lot. Um, I've been writing a lot about um, the open rate as well because of the Apple um, you know, announcement uh, that Skip and Philip were talking about. And I understand that when we're talking about subject lines, what uh, a lot of email marketers do is actually use subject uh, use open rates as being the success metric for testing a subject line i i i don't understand that i really really don't i have tested it so many many times and i found out that every time if your if your objective is actually to achieve conversion so whether it's you know um purchases or downloads uh, event attendance or registration anything like that, you need to be going down the funnel as far as the metrics go because the open rate isn't necessarily um, accurate and it's too easily um, manipulated, right? And you could end up optimizing for the wrong result. And I have seen it done too, too, too many times, right? So this this is the, yeah. So what I'm saying here is that when we're talking about testing and we're talking about the open rate and what's going to be happening, 
I don't see it as being a big issue. I see that we've been doing it wrong in the first place. And for me, it's a great, it's a great time now for us to be actually going in and understanding we need to be testing using different metrics. And I always believe that the metric should be mapping back to the objective for the email or for the program, right? Here's an example, all right? This is one of my, my um, clients. The hypothesis, this was for a first purchase program and it's for a subject line, right? Which as we know, normally gets based on open rates. A subject line that promotes all the savings to be had with brand X will deliver more conversions than one stating the broad benefits. So that's a hypothesis. And um, if we rush through the results, cause we, we're short on time here, we can actually see, so we'll see that the open rate, it's not significant at all. It's not statistically significant. The click rate is, it's, it's got a weak 80% statistical significance. However, the conversion rate, the uplift is 98% and the, the statistical significance is 99%, which is amazing, right? So this is the kind of thing we want to be doing. I don't say don't measure the open rate or the click rate or anything. Understand which is the metric that means the most to you, mapping back to your objective, right? And then one of the other basic things that we need to be doing is making sure that we are doing that iterative learning, that we will implement the, 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 the winning result or the, the, the learnings, right? The insights that we've gained from performing that test and then we're going to actually start up a new one. And I'm gonna show you some examples of how you can do that with our marketing automation as well, because we wanna be doing that iteratively as well. So Philip referred to the three levels, level one, level two, and level three. And, I've and I'm kind of pulling them into this session here because I think it was a great example and really, really easy and you know easy to understand. And you guys have already voted on them too, so this is great. Now, testing for level one personalization so, you know, you can be doing the, the basic ones of testing the first name or testing just, you know, maybe slotting the business name or something like this, you know, or else we can go, which is something incredibly easy to do, and that's use your marketing automation programs, which are innately personalized in the first place, right? So they're innately personalized, they're timely, they're, they're these are why they deliver such amazing results because of that, because they're customer service oriented. They're what the people want. They're what our consumers want because they're so helpful. Yeah. Now, there's different ways that you can be testing these, but I strongly re recommend if you're not testing your marketing automation programs, you're, you, I mean, you, you're leaving money on the table right there, right? Just because you have put a lot of thought and consideration and effort into them doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best they're going to get. You want to be iteratively improving them. So here's one example that you could be doing, right? And this is a stream, an automated stream, and they've gone in and performed individual tests for some of the emails within that stream, right? So you can be doing that. I find that to be very fiddly. Um, again, it's, it's up to you, right? But I'm just showing you there's this one, um, one um, option out there for you to be doing that. And then each of those emails will have their own hypothesis based upon mapping back to their individual um, objective for each of those emails, right? The other option is to A-B test complete streams. So what that means then is that you just build in, when you're building your uh, marketing automation program, you just build in a second stream. And then when you have the winner, you just replace it, you create a new hypothesis and replace that content with the, with the new content to meet the new hypothesis. And so you are perpetually just optimizing this. And then, um, it, you know, it, it's it's sweet. It really is sweet. Then what you want to be doing is making sure that you don't stop it too soon. And this is where I find a lot of the um, problems happen. 
because we don't get taught how to, in fact, we don't really get taught how to do testing in email at all, but we don't get taught how to test automations because testing automations is a little bit more akin to testing a, a landing page than it is an email campaign. It's not so campaign oriented. It's actually got to be run for a, a period of time. So it's more the time effect, whereas running a, a normal campaign is you, you push send, it will send it to you know X amount of people, and then you go and identify which is the result and is it statistically significant. So understand that there's a little bit, you know, there's that slightly different techniques used or methodology used when you're testing your automations and make sure that you keep on checking, check to see if it's statistically significant results and then only stop it then, right? And of course you want to be recording your results. Your second purchase program here, your, your basket abandonment program and you know you're going to be putting down your hypothesis you're going to be looking at what the factors are that you've changed and all the rest of it right so in this particular case you could be if you wanted to if you had a uh, a browse abandonment program for example you might want to um, maybe you're currently doing it overtly you're currently saying oh wait you know we saw you browsing on this or something you may want to be testing the covert way, right? So that's one way of doing it. Besides actually testing copy and, and motivations and all the rest of it. I've just thrown this one in too. Um, oh, no, I don't want to say that. I have put this one in. <laughs> I've placed it very carefully in because it's actually really important particularly when you are testing your marketing automation programs, right? Those, those life cycle programs. Because what happens is that when we're testing, uh, when we're actually looking at the conversions, and if we're going with conversions, often when I've gone in and I've been auditing my clients and everything, I can see that they're actually using the typical web page conversion rate calculation. So understand that email and web are two different things. One's a push channel and one's a pull channel, right? So first of all. Secondly, particularly with email altogether, but particularly with a, a, an automated program, right, we want to be including the entire program into the calculation. So if we only use the website conversion um, you know, calculation, which is number of products sold divided by number of sessions, of web sessions, all we're doing is actually having a look at the landing page and how well it's performing, right? Which is fine for the website, but it's not fine for our marketing, marketing automation program. So what we want to be doing is converting that and using a different calculation uh, formula, which is number of products sold divided by number of emails delivered, okay? That's going to give us a more um, holistic, but a, a more true factor of an, an indication of how well that actual program is performing. So here we can see the old conversion calculation. This is a really interesting one. This is for a first purchase program. And it was long and informative versus short and concise. Okay, so we can see that the short and concise is actually winning all the way so opens, clicks, call to actions, average order value, it won all the way, yep, until it got to the conversion and then it actually failed. So the long and informative one. Now, why is that? It's because it's only looking at the landing page and the conversion that's happening there. It hasn't actually, this conversion, this calculation hasn't taken into account the whole journey. But if we actually go in and have a look and use that number of products sold divided by number of emails sent and use that calculation, then we've actually got the right one. And the short and concise one in this case with a 27% uplift. And we can see it's gone all the way through being positive. <clears throat> so now let's go and jump into the testing for levels two and three personalization you know, referring back to what Philip was, you know, his three levels there. And this is what I was saying, sort of like priming you for at the very, very beginning when I was saying to you, what's our objective? Why do we want to be 
um, having implementation, I mean, having personalization, implementing personalization into our email program. And it's because of the customer lifetime value, right, is really, really crucial to um, the customer experience. How do you measure customer experience? Well, there's, you know, you can, there's lots of different ways, right? And, and particularly when you're looking at different tactics. But overall, customer lifetime value is one of the success metrics that you're going to be using to be seeing if you're actually increasing the customer um, experience, right? So on that basis then, when we're testing for personalization, we want to be measuring for customer lifetime value as well as your campaign metrics. Now, years ago, a couple of years ago, we actually put out a survey and we found uh, in the email marketing personalization report and we asked them, if you've tested the effects of personalization, did they provide an uplift? And the top one we can see there is they just actually measured the campaign metrics. And we can see that not 100% of them found that they had an uplift. However, those that actually tested and looked at the results, both on a campaign level and a customer lifetime value level, they all found that they got an uplift with using personalization. So this is this is what we need to be doing, right? Understanding, this is what I was talking to you at the very beginning about the longitudinal you know, um, findings and discoveries, why it's so important for us to be recording the results, why it's so important for us to be measuring the, the correct success metrics. Um, so just keep that in mind, right? And uh, this is another thing too, right? have a long-term control group. Now this is, I wouldn't, I don't recommend this for, um, for level one, but for level two, it will come in handy if you're trying to prove the value of personalization. So your control group is actually those that currently are getting your existing program, which is without personalization. And then, you actually bring in personalization. And for you to be able to measure that on a long-term basis, including customer lifetime value, you can't keep chopping and changing the control group. You have to keep them the same. And so over a period of time, the control group actually ends up becoming a holdout group as such. But you're not choosing them for any particular thing it's not because they haven't given you information or they have given you information or anything like that you're randomly choosing the control group in the first place right but they're going to stay that as being that control group during this test so that you can prove over time what you know whether email or personalized emails are actually delivering the goods that you think that they will do right so that's really what that ends up being about Again, that's not going to just stay flat for everyone, uh, uh, like a, a given for everyone, and certainly not in every case. Like, for example, if you're going to be doing the overt versus, um, you know, um, covert, you don't need you don't need that control group there. You don't need a, or a perpetual one, right? A, a, a constant same group of people. Um, it's really only when you're wanting to uh, show the value of something over the uh, over not having it right so slow i'm sorry <laughs> we're, we're at the end now anyhow this is the takeaways the takeaways are set up a permanent testing stream for your automated programs and update a, you know, with new with a new test whenever necessary, whenever the other one's finished. Always use a hypothesis. Know when to use a control or a holdout group. Um, ensure you use the correct metric of, to measure success. Keep running the test until it's statistically significant if you're using a marketing automation one um, or if you're testing a marketing automation um, uh, test. 
record the results, gain the learnings, right? And uh, apply, you can be applying these learnings to other channels as well, because remember what did I say at the very beginning? Your test, right, your test group that you're actually using is actually your, your database. They are, ma it's, it's made up of your prospects and of, of your customers, your first time purchasers, your second time purchasers, your loyal customers, your, your lost customers, right? So start to, to understand, and this is a this is really, really valuable. And once you start to understand that, then you can go, oh, so we could actually do some initial tests in email and then roll the results out. So again, with your personalization, you may not have personalization on your website yet. Test it in your email first. If you find it works, then you can roll it out, right? And you're already quite well advanced with that. So, um, and that, that's it for me. So um, I think I probably presented a, a couple of possibly controversial <laughs> points. But anyhow, um, read the book. You might find some more other <laughs> controversial points there as well. So skip. Thanks, Kath. That was a, a great presentation. And folks, I know we are, are quite over time, and, and I apologize for that. Um, but we do have two questions from the audience that I'd like to uh, to get Kath to uh, address before we sign off. Kath, the first one comes from, um, I'm probably going to butcher this name as well, but I'm going to, well, the first name is Zane. That one I got. The second name I'm going to go with is Lejnice. Uh We conduct subject line tests in all our ad hoc email campaigns, 10, 10, 10 percent three subject line versions. The final version, three hours later, not the most perfect scenario for the rest of the 70% is based on unique clicks. How do you feel about such a setup? Okay, I gotta get my head around this. The final version, which is three hours later, yeah, not not ideal, but again, you can, un you can work that one out, right? And it depends on, are you doing it manually, is it automatic, or the rest of it? Um, and again, I, I would be just from that particular point, I'd be going and doing my research and understanding when it, they're more likely to, co to convert, right? Um, uh, I, I've read some research uh, that was done by a friend of mine, uh, Della Quist at um, Alchemy Works. And what they did was they actually found out that everyone who was opening opened right at the very beginning. And those that were actually clicking and converting weren't doing it till like 24, 48 hours later. So, but they'd been optimizing for all those that were opening, but those that were opening weren't actually, the ones that opened at the very beginning, they didn't, they didn't purchase, right? So this is the kind of thing you need to do. Go in, delve into your data and find out. Okay. Um, and then the next, the next question is, from, again, from Andrew Boddington, is setting the sample size, oh, this, off my screen is set in, in setting the sample size what about randomizing and what methods should you be using um yeah so um i i with setting the sample size uh, i'm not a unlike skip who's gone and done this as part of his um university degree um that is not my bag at all so i use online calculators <laughs> there's a lot of them out there they're fantastic um, and you know, and and do it that way. That that's the best thing to do. Again, about randomizing, it depends on your system. Your system will often do that for you. If you're running them as a manual tester, you're going to have to find another another tool to be able to do that because th that's the best thing to do. You don't want to just say, you know, they they truly need to be randomized. So there's a yeah. there's a great great way to do it if you if you're doing it manually. Uh, Excel will generate a random number for you. So if you say if you're taking in cast example, you're going to take twenty percent of your of your sample of your uh, list to test. Uh, you can generate a random number, uh, random unique number for everybody, and then um, you know say cut off at twenty percent because it comes out as a decimal. So you know that's one way to do it. Um, the other thing on randomization, as much as we'd like to say, you know. Testing is, te I'm not saying testing is not important, but we're not testing a vaccine. Right? Yeah. So if it's not 100% random, you're probably not going to have um, a problem. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> as I say, we are we are way over. Uh, we just got a question from Ernest Ang, but I think we're going to have to pass on that one today. Ernest, don't worry, we'll get back to you because uh, that is a great question. Um, 
And uh, Kath, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a brilliant presentation as, as always. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all. Okay, so um, I'm going to try to share my screen, although that, that, that could be fraught. Here we are. Oh, look at that. Okay, so uh, first, um, thank you to uh, our sponsor, Iterable, um, without which this whole, pre this whole uh, event would not have been possible. Uh, also, I want to uh, thank all of our brilliant speakers, uh, Philip, Gianfranco, and Kath. All great presentations, lots of good takeaways there. I hope you got a lot out of that. Don't forget that one lucky person will win a copy, a Kindle version of Kath's book, uh, Holistic Email Marketing. Uh, I think uh, we'll announce that winner tomorrow on social media and we'll be in touch to the, with the person directly uh, with the download codes and all of that sort of thing. Uh, and with that, I just want to say thank you uh, and for sticking with us. The, those of you that are still with us, uh, thank you for sticking with us. We uh, apologize sincerely for some of the tech issues that we had, um, all of which were, or most of which at least were out of our control. Um, but hopefully what you saw was uh, what I like to describe uh, as a duck, cool, cool and calm on top while we were fiercely paddling underneath. Um, <laughs> uh, I hope that we can do this again. Uh, until then, please, please enjoy the rest of your day, be safe, and make good choices.